and I really appreciate uh, your heart in that. So this right here is a box. Um, it's a box of love notes that I wrote to my wife uh, while we were dating, and uh, they, they actually date all the way back to 1990. Hard to believe that it's been 32 years uh, since I was a, uh, a freshman in high school, and I noticed this beautiful eighth grade girl and took a fancy to her and I started uh, actually the first way that I conversed with her was writing a note that she ended up giving to the youth pastor who read it in front of everybody uh, <laughs> don't you love that <laughs> youth pastors right uh, but uh, little known to me uh, she had started saving all the notes and, and uh, I, I brought these because there's there's a, a purpose in, in wanting to share we we dated six years before we got married I think it'd be very tough if for you to come up here and just pick a random note or card open it up and read it and try to understand our journey like you might be able to get a glimpse from this one card which says I need your love and I don't get it when you're gone but at least you're back now and I can get some of your love again. Yay, I missed you so much, Jamie. I'm glad, I'm so glad you're back. Welcome back. I think I was really glad she was back, right? <laughs> I love you, love always. And another card that says, missed you so much inside. You could come up and grab an individual card or grab an individual letter and, and get a glimpse of what is happening in, what was happening in that moment of our friendship and our relationship but you wouldn't be able to understand the whole journey. Let alone try to take an individual note, turn to the second page, and I did not look, I probably should have looked at these notes. Turn to the second page and read an individual sentence. I'll do my best to get over this dumb anger today, and hopefully you'll forgive me for acting so selfishly. Yeah, I really should have, uh, should have uh, been a little bit more careful. So that's, that's a note that I wrote her. And I drew a picture of a bouquet of flowers because I'm cheap. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember writing this at all, but I, I was it. It would be really hard for you to read a, an individual sentence on the second page of a letter and try to understand our journey. Now, now, I would never do this, but I could take the time to try to go through every note and put it in a chronological order and then go from start to finish. And you might be able to, if you were so bored that you would read all of those notes, you might be able to get an idea of what our relationship actually was and have a much better understanding of it. Now, I say that because when we approach the Bible and we just grab a few verses we're doing exactly what I was talking about someone could do if they came and take a letter and read a, a, just a few sentences. Many people would consider themselves, many Christians would consider themselves verse of the day people. But, but here's what we often miss is that a verse that we pull out, say out of Galatians, we're in Galatians, Galatians chapter two says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. What a great verse. Who wrote it? Why was it written? When was it written? What was the purpose it was written for? That really matters for us to fully understand what that verse means. We'll get to it in a few weeks, but in Galatians chapter 5, we read of the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What does that mean? Why was it written? Who was it written to? When was it written? And this is very, very important as we approach Galatians. So if you haven't been with us these last couple of weeks or this is your first time or first time in a long time, we started four weeks ago in the book of Galatians and we're just, we're just taking our time. But, but here's what we continuously return back to. It was a letter written by a real man and his name was Paul to a real group of people they were called the Galatian believers and, and, and they existed at a very real time in a real place and he was talking to them about a very specific issue so as we approach the scriptures even today we have to go with this knowledge of this this isn't just grab a letter this is why in the context of it 
And it's taken us far longer than I ever expected to get through chapter number one, although I don't apologize for it. It's just taken us way longer than I thought. But but it's really important as we continue and close chapter one today to take everything we've learned so far into what we're about to read. And again, if you haven't been here, what we've learned so far is that Paul is writing to these Galatian believers, a place where he preached the gospel, where he planted a church from those who believed, and then he left, and someone came behind him called a Judaizer group of people who said, oh, no, no, Paul's not giving you the complete gospel. Paul's only telling you a part of it. You also not only should believe in Jesus, but you also must do these Jewish things and observe diets and and, and observe holy days and, and follow Jewish customs and man that made sense because everyone knew that Jews were God's people they were the people of Jehovah and so now if we're going to follow Jehovah then we we have to do the same thing right and Paul man he writes this letter because he's saying no that's not okay that's that's not all right the gospel that I am trying to show you is that Jesus Christ came he lived this life this perfect life and he lived it on your behalf and he went to the cross to bring atonement for your sins and it is not your good works that give you a way to God it is not your good works that give you a right standing with God it is only your faith in what Jesus has done for you that's what Paul's trying to get across over and over and he delved into his testimony which we've been over the last two weeks we've been Paul's testimony And that's where we're going to start, but we're going to begin in verse 13 this morning, and we're going to read all the way through the end of the chapter, picking up with Paul's testimony. Before we read the passage, though, I want to tell you the main point of today's message. He's going to share testimony for a purpose. He's not just saying, hey, it's testimony time. Well, let me tell you what the Lord did for me. The Lord made a big change in my life. That's not the only reason he's going to give his testimony. What he's wanting to show the Galatians is that a true encounter with Jesus will always result in transforming, but also in enduring change. And it's that's important because there are many people who will claim to have a relationship with Jesus, but they're actually believing in incomplete or a false gospel about Jesus which results in little to no change in their life over time or it results in little to no growing relationship with Jesus. And we need both. And they come together. So the Apostle Paul's going to give his testimony, but there's a purpose behind it. So if you would, we're going to start in verse 13, and I'd love for you to follow along with me. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul says this, For you have heard... Of my former life in Judaism. How I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. So again, those two verses we spent a week on. Look at look at the duplicity. I was advancing in Judaism, but I was a violent persecutor. I was doing well while I was living a life of murder. Verse 15, where we were last week. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And I'm gonna pause right there. We're not done, but pause right there because this is where we were last week. We see Paul's transformation. Like, this is who I was. And then Jesus was revealed to me. And wow, this is who I am. And for this purpose, to preach. He didn't change me just for change's sake. He changed me so I could preach about the change Jesus brings to everyone. But he doesn't just stop with his testimony there. He's saying why he's sharing this, right? So he's gonna, here's what we're going to do. This is who I was. This is what happened. 
this is why it happened, and let me back up just a few words, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, right? So when Jesus was revealed to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, verse 17. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. That's also the Peter, that's Apostle Peter, to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing you before God, I do not lie. Then I went to the regions of, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. So if we're just looking for, well, how does this apply to me? What did the last seven verses do for us? It's a travel journal. Did, did, you, did we gather together today to find out why Paul went where he went and who he talked to after his transformation? Then why is it in the scriptures? And truthfully, I think it'd be very easy for us to even think, well, like, you could just leave that out. Well, Paul, it mattered to him. Again, he's, he's addressing these Galatians with a letter that says, what I'm preaching to you is the truth. What you've been hearing is false. And let me tell you about my travels after I was transformed. And so basically Paul's saying like, you know the change in me and it happened because God revealed Jesus to me and here's what happened. After that happened, I didn't go sit at the feet of some teacher. I immediately went Wherever God told me, and I started preaching, and here I preached here, and I preached here, and I preached here, and I talked to this person, and this person, and this person, and you could document it all, and that's been my story. Once I met Jesus, I have only been teaching what Jesus taught me to teach, and people are hearing about it. And as they hear about the God who used to persecute the church is now preaching to the church, oh, they were so excited and they have started glorifying God because of me. And that is my authority for addressing the problem in the church. So Paul's using his travels to show the people I have only done what Jesus has asked me to do that is my authority for challenging these false teachers that are coming to you. We'll get a little bit more into that in the next chapter. But you, for those of you that haven't been here, and even for those of you that would, we skipped one verse in chapter one. And we skipped it on purpose because I said, I'm going to come back to that at the end of the chapter because it's going to be the hinge. It's going to be the hinge of chapter one. Paul starts out with this harsh criticism and he tells his heavenly calling, but there's a hinge on it. And it's, chap it's verse number 10. We haven't read verse 10 yet. But chapter 1 of verse 10 of Galatians becomes the connection between Paul's harsh criticism and his heavenly calling. It says this, For am I, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now again, here's what we can't do. We can't just take that verse and pull it out and go like, oh, I know what he means. Where, where does it fit into what Paul's showing? Paul preaching is being challenged. And what can Paul do? Walk away. If you don't want to believe me, that's fine. Just don't believe me. We still be friends. I preach, I preach the truth to you. If you don't believe it, that's on you. But Paul says, oh, I am writing this letter that you might think of a criticism because more than I want you to be happy with me, 
more than I desire to have this joyful relationship between the two of us, although I want it, more than I want to please man, I want to please God. If I didn't want to please God, I wouldn't be serving Christ at all. Now, to me, that last sentence of Galatians 1.10 has got to be one of the most challenging or even provoking sentences in the entire Bible. But think of how true it would be. If we lived our lives trying to please people, how often would we actually serve Jesus? Because doesn't serving Jesus often bring us into conflict with people? But again, this, this isn't just about, well, I need to do what's right when everyone's not. This isn't just about peer pressure. This is about a man who is saying, if I don't address this issue with you, your thinking about Jesus will be completely wrong. I have to step into this area. I have to be willing to confront you because my greatest desire in life is to please God, not to please man. Because Paul knows the ultimate end of his glorification, or ultimate end of his preaching, is God's glorification, not man's. So he's willing to point out their wrong beliefs. And it's a lesson we must all take to heart. Because as we serve God in a world that is less and less caring what God has to say, it will bring us into conflict. We saw this in the national news this week. Five men from a major league baseball team called the Tampa Bay Rays, I think five, refused to put on the sleeve of their jersey a gay pride logo. Now, again, they said we're not going to wear the gay pride logo on our jersey, although this is gay pride month in our nation. They were blasted by the national media. They are blasted by other ballplayers. They are blasted by celebrities. Here's what one of the men said. Basically, for me, it comes down to my faith. It's a faith-based decision, so it's a hard decision. Because ultimately, we, meaning the us, we all said that we want is them, those, maybe those who are homosexuals. We want them to know that all are welcome and loved here. But when we put it on our bodies, I think a lot of guys decided that it's just a lifestyle that maybe, not that we look down on anybody or think differently, it's just that maybe we don't want to encourage it if we believe in Jesus, who's encouraged us to live a lifestyle that would abstain from, be, from, from, that, would abstain from that behavior. Just like Jesus encourages me as a heterosexual male to abstain from sex outside the confines of marriage. It's no different. It's not judgmental. It's not looking down. It's just what we believe the lifestyle he's encouraged us to live for our good, not to withhold. But again, we love these men and women. We care about them and we want them to feel safe and welcome here. What a God-honoring response. And yet, the national media is blasting these men. One headline, the raised pitcher who didn't wear pride patch hides behind Jesus. Time out. Yeah, he did. Because that's where we're supposed to be. Colossians chapter 3, my life hid in Christ. I am supposed to stand right behind Jesus so much so because I don't want to stand in front of Jesus because I don't want people to see me when they see me. I want to stand right behind Jesus and live a life of love where when they see me, they should see me hiding behind Jesus. Not because I'm scared to confront, but because I am following this man who loved me so much. God man, I should say. This God man who loved me so much, he came and he gave his life to turn me into his one of his own why wouldn't I follow him but you see what happens is when we live a life that is not worried about pleasing God 
It's about pleasing man. What we won't do is what Paul said he did after his transformation. Ha, I was transformed. God revealed Jesus to me. And after he did, guess what? I went here and here and here and here and here. And I talked to him and him and him and him. I want you to know what I was doing was I was following the one who called me because my greatest desire is to please God and not to please man. And so, so three short lessons from the text today. Three lessons. First, God's pleasure in you is not determined by your performance for him. God's pleasure in you is not determined by your performance for him. There, so in two times in chapter one, and we read both of them today, you'll find the word pleased. Look, look at verse 10. We just read it. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. We're talking about, I'm not trying to please man. I want to serve Christ. So we see please. But then look at verse number 16. Starts a little bit with verse 15. But when he would set me, before I, set me apart before I was born and call me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. So two times we find pleased. Here's what the text does not say. After God revealed Jesus to me and I went to preach, God was pleased with me. It's not what it says. It says God was pleased. He found great pleasure in revealing who Jesus was to this religious hypocrite. And it doesn't say that God was pleased that this religious hypocrite went to go preach. I love that. Because it has to bring us back to the faith, to, to the idea that God is not concerned. He's not overwhelmingly pleased with how we serve him. He's pleased with our faith in him. You say, well, does that mean God doesn't care about our works? Absolutely not. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, we find that God has prepared good works for us to accomplish. But we have to take that into Hebrews 11. Think with me about Hebrews 11. It's called the Hall of Faith. There's all these different men and women listed in Hebrews 11 that God says, I want you to follow their example. And if we're not careful, we turn to Hebrews 11 and we see by Noah, or by faith Noah did this, and by faith Moses did this, and by faith David did this, and by faith Gideon and all these others did this, and we think, well, God's pleased with what they did. No. No. He's pleased with their faith. Because it says in, in, in Hebrews eleven six, without faith, it is impossible to please him. This starts off the list of the hall of faith. So, but if God's not wanting our actions, he's wanting our faith, then do our actions count? Yes, because true faith always moves the believer into action for God. Once again, what did we see in Paul's life? I was transformed when Jesus was revealed to me. So I went to church the next Sunday and sat there. And then I went to church the next Sunday and sat there. And then I went to church the next Sunday and sat there. Nope. God revealed Jesus to me. And I went preached him to everyone that he asked me to and I went here and here and here and here and here and here and here. True faith, the faith that pleases God is a faith that never sits back and says, well, I just have faith. No, no, you don't just have faith. Faith always moves us into action that faith pleases God and the resulting action well, maybe it pleases God. I don't know God that well, but I know it's the faith behind the action that truly pleases him. We see that so clearly. We see, it's evident in the Gospels. If anybody could have pleased God with their actions, it was the Pharisees. They were a religious activity, just moment after moment, pumping out the law. Religious law. And Jesus said, eh, 
I mean, you honor me with your mouth, but your heart's far from me. And see, God's not looking for a group of mindless, obedient servants who just do his law. No, no. He's looking for people who believe so much in Jesus, whose hearts are so much sourced in faith in Jesus that we can't stop living our lives serving Jesus. But it's not about the service. It's about the faith that moves us into service. I think so many Christians struggle to understand God's love and approval because, because we're stuck in this place that we think God is, is like waiting for us to live a life that pleases him. And then he's going to love us. But, but that's not true. God is not waiting for us to live in a way that pleases him before he loves us. But that's so often what we think. Once I do this, God will be happy with me. No, 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 no. God already loves you because of who you are. That then should motivate us to live in a way that pleases him. I don't do this stuff to please God. God is, he, he loves me. And because he loves me, I want to serve him however he asks me. That's an action motivated by faith. I was privileged to coach Tro Troy and Trevor in Little League. And if you've ever played Little League, if you ever watched it, you know, you know that every kid that goes up to bat wants to make mom, dad, or grandma, grandpa, who's ever in the crowd, he wants to make them happy. She wants to make them happy by getting a hit. But I coached long enough to know this. There were kids who walked up with a bat that if they struck out, they were so disappointed because they knew their parents would be so disappointed. I just wanted to get a hit to make dad happy. Now he's not going to be happy. But you also had the kids who walked up with a bat who struck out and their dad or mom was, sorry, man, you got him next time. You know what? When, when that kid gets a hit and he's, he's standing on, we got somebody talking to me. Awesome, man. When that kid gets a hit, there you go. Amen. <laughs> Somebody else say amen. Why are we got to wait for a baby? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when that kid gets a hit, and he's not going up there thinking, if I fail, my dad's going to be so disappointed in me. When he goes up there, and he actually gets a hit, and he's on second base, and he's standing there, and he looks at his dad, and his dad's like, good job, man. He's so happy because he pleased his dad. It makes him happy. Man, but he knew I don't, have to be, I don't have to be on second base for my dad to love me. I don't have to be on second base for my dad to, to be pleased with me. Oh, man, that kid lives in freedom. That's how God wants us to live, in freedom. We can serve him with joy. We will fail. You think when we fail, God's like, you puny little excuse for a son. You fail me all. No. No, that's not who our God is. Oh, but when we learn more about who Jesus is and we see how much he loves us and we're like God loves us, even if I fail, oh, that makes me just want to serve him even more. Number two, a true encounter with Jesus will always result in transforming and enduring change. The gospel says it's not my works that please God. It's the faith behind those works that pleases God. And anyone who truly and fully grasps this will experience transforming and enduring change. Again, that's why Paul has to say, here's where I went. You could see it wasn't just immediate obedience. It was immediate obedience. And it was lasting and enduring faithfulness. And it was all about the glory of God. When someone truly has an encounter with Christ, there's always an immediate obedience to what he asks. There's always continued faithfulness. And there's a God-honoring purpose behind it. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've seen people have a come-to-Jesus moment. And we've seen that with Jeremy. And Jeremy, I appreciate your, 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 honest and trans, your, your honesty and your transparency in your journey. And I love you, man. And you've been such an encouraging, encouragement to me. But, but when I was a youth pastor, we would re I would regularly have people who grew up in the youth group have that come to Jesus moment. And their first thing is, hey, can I talk to the youth group? And when I was first youth pastor, somebody came to me and said that. I'm like, yeah, come on up here. Come talk to the youth group. Love it. And this guy, man, he... he 
He had everyone in tears. This is the life I was living. And God just saved me from it and transformed my life. Man, it was awesome. It was heart moving. The problem was three months later, he was back into everything that he said God had saved him from. See, a true encounter with Jesus, it does bring immediate obedience to whatever God calls you, but it will it be an enduring change. Now, I'm not saying an encounter with Jesus makes one sinless. I'm not, I'm not trying to say sinless. But when you have a true encounter with Christ that goes to the depths of your heart, it will always result in a lasting faithfulness. And, and, and here's what we're looking for when people want to talk about the change in their life. Uh, we, we always need to be cheering up people who experience change. We always need to be cheering for it. But what will be evident when it's true change is it's not about the change I'm making. I stand here telling you about the change Christ is making in me. And so all glory to God. And that's what we see in Paul's life. Finally, number three, this is a quote by David Platt, but it's the third point. Waiting time is not wasted time. So you think of the Apostle Paul. He had such unique experiences in his life. He was a Pharisee. He also would become the greatest missionary for Jesus Christ to ever live. Somewhere along the line, he met Jesus. And here's, here's what we have to understand. When he met Jesus, he went through a transformation, but he also had to go through a time of teaching. And we're not going to go back and read it, but if you read what Paul says, he went, after meeting Jesus, he went for three years to Arabia. Now, now here's what some theologians will say. He went three years to this place called Arabia where Jesus came to tutor him just like he had tutored his other disciples. Other theologians will say, no, it's, it, maybe that did happen, but, but what we do know is that, is that Christ wanted Saul outside of the hub of Jerusalem because he didn't need to be the center of attention as a brand new believer. So he's here for three years. and Actually, just those couple of verses we read in Galatians is a 14-year span of Paul's life. And here's why that's important. Because Paul had no idea what was next. He was just obedient in the moment. Man, and I would love to encourage your hearts the same way that God is continuously working in our lives for what is coming next. The problem is we don't know what's next, so we just have to be obedient in the moment. Paul goes through this transformation. He has no idea. He's going to take three missionary journeys and write most of the New Testament. Paul goes through this transformation. What does he do? Whatever the Lord wants me to do, that's where I'm going next. And then I'll go here next. And then I'll go here next. Tonight in our home groups, one of the things that we'll ask everyone to do is to share their testimony of coming to Christ. And then we're also going to say, now that you've heard everyone's testimony, where do you see Christ working in their life before they knew it? About a week and a half ago, I was sitting at the rec center. I was invited by uh, Audre King to, to participate in what was called Prayer on the Porch. And he's, just, he's doing it all throughout the summer, having two pastors uh, on one, one day of the month come and pray for Page County. There was myself and Pastor Archie Webster. I love Pastor Webster so much. And uh, so the two of us were together, and there was three other people that came to the Prayer on the Porch. I didn't know the other three at all. Ms. Carolyn, what are, what are the names? Val and Alan Harris. Val and Alan Harris, I got to meet them. They go to Rileyville. Have been in the area less than two years from South Carolina. Another man, his name was Damon, and he's helped, Damon's helping out at the rec center. So the five of us are sitting on the porch. No one really knew each other, so we all kind of introduced ourselves a little bit. And we started to pray, and one person prayed, and then someone else prayed, and then we paused and just kind of chatted a little bit. And then Pastor Archie goes, you know what? Let's think about this. Only God 
could put together this group. We got two people who were just living in South Carolina who retired to Virginia. We got a pastor, we got a guy from Chicago. We got a guy who was just not too long ago strung out on drugs. And they got me, an African American pastor. And the five of us are sitting on this porch praying for Page County, Virginia. Only God. <laughs> and I thought, the longer I've thought about that, like, what a unique... We're praying for Page County, Virginia, and I don't even think there was a Page County native there. God's bringing people from all over the place to pray for the place where many of you grew up. <laughs> What's God doing? That is so and just amazing to me. I have no doubt there are some of you who are sitting in this room today, and it would blow your mind if five years ago someone were to you'd be sitting in a church service in Luray, Virginia, hearing about Jesus. It might blow your mind geographically because you're like, I'd never live that place. That's how we would feel. It might blow your mind spiritually like I would never go to church. It might blow your mind thinking like, I cannot, there's no way I would ever find myself there. But look at, God always knew you'd be here today. I love that. That means he is not wasting any time of your life. Oh, we sometimes can think we waste time, but we have a God that Romans 8, 28 is so real that he can work all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his promise. And so don't forget, you might be on the precipice of a breakthrough that you have no idea is coming trust God follow him by obeying what you know to do today and remain faithful where God has planted you until God moves you and when he moves you step boldly into what he has next for you Ms. Daylene and I have this conversation regularly she has told me with her arm around me many times. I hope God never takes you away from Mount Carmel. And here's my thought. God can do whatever he wants to with me. I never would have thought I'd come to Mount Carmel. <laughs> How good it has been. But I never would have chose this for myself. I was at my home church with my family, with our people. And God takes us out to show us, to reveal Jesus to us. So you know what, if God, I'm not, I'm not saying I want it. I'm saying if God wants to move me, I'm getting in line. I'm gone. I'm going. I'm with you. Whatever you want. The Apostle Paul went boom, 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 boom. Brian Hassey, I'm no Apostle Paul. I'm just going to get in line. I'm going to obey what he asks me to do today. And if he ever asks me to go somewhere, to do something, be anything else, I'm going to step boldly into it, knowing he knows what's best. And he is always preparing my future today. And he's doing the same for you. Your future is being prepared today. Step boldly when he asks. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful letter that you've used one of your dear servants to craft the people he loved. Oh. Lord, I, I read this and I'm just, I'm overwhelmed with this man that loved you so much. He was willing to just never be in one place he just wanted he just wanted to go wherever Jesus wanted him to go because he loved Jesus so much it was that step of immediate obedience and that step of continued those steps of continued faithfulness and Lord it's not about where we are it's about who we're serving Lord I pray that you would open up our hearts as believers that we don't have to do something to earn your love, that your love is given, it's poured out on us. And Lord, may that poured out love be, be more of the transformation we need to live lives that are full of faith in Jesus. So full of faith that if you ask us to take a step that we were never anticipating, we still do it with confidence and boldness. 
If we're supposed to have a conversation with someone, if we're supposed to open up our home, if we're supposed to step into a need, Lord, that we never would have thought we would ever step into, that we just do it with boldness and faithfulness, knowing that it's about Jesus and it's about the glory of God, not about us. You are, you are crafting amazing stories. Oh, I, love, I can't wait to hear the testimonies tonight in our home group. As we just all get to see this, this beautiful web that you have been weaving that comes together in one moment, in one house. Oh, at one time, this is, it's going to be so good. And we are going to rejoice not in our stories. We're going to rejoice in the author of our stories. How good you have been. And Lord, help us to have hearts that say we're not going to live to please men. But we're going to live lives that are faithful to our God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as, as the one who came as the Messiah of the world, who stepped into his creation to, to save his creation from the rebellion that we ourselves chose, oh, I will, I'll be down front. And while we sing this last song and we rehearse the goodness of Jesus and what that goodness of Jesus should lead us to, if you don't personally know the goodness of Jesus I would love to share that with you. And I would invite you to come and just grab my hand or say, hey, just tell me more. And I'll also be at the back door today. But it's about knowing who Jesus is, knowing what Jesus has done for us. And he is our only hope to know God, to be accepted by God. But he is all we need for that. Ah, thank you, Jesus, for who you are. May this church be a church that loves to please God as a church of faith. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand? And we're gonna sing that song that, we, that Aaron taught us earlier.